So hello, everyone. I am lucky enough to be able to show you the uh, prettiest portion of the uh, lecture here of the of the class. So we get to work on results visualization. Uh, RAS Mapper is normally this would be your first introduction to RAS Mapper in the class. Uh, so several of these slides you will have already been through, already seen, already worked with. So I might uh, fast forward through a few of them, but the circled layer icon here is going to be your uh, your gateway to uh, pretty results visualization. And we're going to be discussing how to compare different results, how to debug our model, see why did water enter this location, and how we can uh, iterate on our geometry and uh, use that to make a better model. So this is the main window here that you will see when you launch RAS Mapper. So we have it sectioned off into a somewhat prototypical GIS uh, grouping where you have your main view area, your map window in the center. Uh, you have a set of controls that either affect your mouse, so whether you're selecting items, whether you're clicking and dragging, uh, zooming in or zooming out tools, and a, a couple of other helpful visualization tools. On the left-hand side, we have the layer list, and uh, I might also call this the tree sometimes. So if I say, hey, go to the results section of the tree and check something on, this is what we would be referring to. Uh, the lower left corner, there's a bunch of tabs that I'm assuming you have at least played with a little bit earlier. I think we were working with uh, jumping to certain views there. So this is the status area, and those various views take you to different helpful windows to control RAS Mapper. And up in the top right, this is our animation bar. So a lot of RAS Mapper will uh, react to the layer that you select on the left-hand side, and the animation controls is how you interact with layers that have various time steps that we can change. Zooming into the layer list, this is a, uh, like we said, a kind of typical GIS uh, top to bottom rendering. So uh, up at the top there, we have our features bucket. We will automatically create a profile lines shape file for you to edit and add to. Uh, but you can add your own, so you can add or import multiple shape files there if you have are trying to differentiate various uh, various polyline or polygon shape files. Uh, right beneath that, we have the geometry section. We will automatically add geometries to this that you have created in RAS. Uh, if you are looking to create a new geometry, you can right click the bold geometries node up there and do so. Uh, other than that, like within a geometry, uh, it is a normal. Uh, tree style, you have to check all the way down the list to be able to view an element. Uh, you can see it's organized uh, by rivers and cross sections up above. I know some people had trouble finding the interpolation surface earlier. So if you don't see something at the top level here, uh, start expanding these. And hopefully it is in an intuitive spot that you can find in the future uh, interpolation surfaces being kind of a sub property of the cross sections in this case. Uh, beneath that is one is a newer element that hasn't been there historically, event conditions. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of geospatial data, but as we're adding newer like, precipitation and wind features to RAS, we find that we, uh, we found it helpful to add an extra node to be able to view that before you run a model. And then the most important one beneath is results. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time today. So uh, all of your results will be listed top to bottom here, and then you can turn on the various maps. The selected layer, the thing that controls the uh, animation bar that we were looking at earlier, will always be highlighted in magenta there. So we know some people, uh, us included occasionally, have issues uh, remembering what the selected layer is, or you're interacting and wondering why your map isn't changing. Uh, we have it printed several places, and I'll show that later. But uh, the kind of most uh, obvious place to check for is check to see what the magenta highlighted layer is on the left-hand side. Beneath that, we have map layers. This is a little bit of a catch-all bucket. So if you have shape files or rasters that you're looking to add for background data, uh, this is where we put land coverage data that uh, Sam Gibson covered uh, yesterday, the day before. Uh, this is where you would put web map imagery. Uh, that's how you, you know, interact and add web map imagery. So that's our somewhat generic catch-all GIS layer bucket. And then beneath that, uh, at the very bottom, is terrains. So the status area in the lower left corner, I'm um, going to blitz through this a little bit. It was probably easier to show in the demo. But uh, the views we worked with yesterday, so the plus button on the views to say, hey, 
uh, capture my current screen window, wherever I happen to be zoomed into. Uh, give it a helpful name, save it, and this allows you to bounce back and forth to important areas of the model or zoom out to the whole thing. Gary uses it for uh, demonstrations a lot where he'll have seven or eight points of interest that he really cares about, and this helps him give his 30-second spiel, double-click on the next area, and zoom over there. Uh, profile lines over here. This is just a quick and easy way of interacting with the profile lines that was in the features group up top in the tree. So they're the same thing. Uh, Active Features is a cool newer uh, entity here. So if you have a feature layer selected, so a layer with um, vector features there, in this case, it looked like a cross-section layer was selected. You don't have to fish for that on the map to right-click it and get data out of there. If you just select it here, you can go to the Active Features tab, and we will list all of the feature names that we see in that layer. You can right-click any one of these and get the same context menu that you would get if you found it in the map itself. So if somebody asks, hey, what's the uh, state hydrograph, hydrograph at this particular river station? You don't actually have to find that on the map if you don't instantly know where it is in your model. You can scroll through and find it in this list. And then the layer values is brand new. So this is uh, this was a highly requested feature over the last few years. This is uh, normally the selected layer as you're moving your mouse around will have a little highlight pop up there that says your terrain elevation is blah. Uh, many people said, hey, can I get multiple returns there? I'm looking to compare water surfaces from different runs. I'm looking to compare velocities. <clears throat> and sure, it's easy enough to click the other layer, highlight your mouse, click the first layer, highlight your mouse, but it doesn't give you the same exact answer at the same time. So this was a, uh, a nice new feature that uh, Anton implemented there for comparing multiple map values at the same time while you're hovering your mouse on the spot. The uh, profile lines here are uh, any line that you would want to draw in RASMapper to cut water surfaces, velocities, depths, pretty much any map value that we are capable of displaying on the map, we can cut in a line and show you useful information about it. Uh, this uses the same set of editing tools that you were introduced to in your geometry editing and terrain modifications that we were working with earlier. And by default, we throw it into a single generic bucket called profile lines and uh, shows up in this kind of special first party citizen tab down in the lower left corner. Um, in addition to the normal profile of water surface depth, et cetera there, you can ask for, <coughs> excuse me, um, time series data there. So we do a decent job aggregating information along the profile line. So what happens if you cut a line through a choke point of your model there, right? So in, I guess I have an image here, you don't. In the Muncie case here, uh, uh, let me see if I can get my mouse. So if you cut a line across this section of Muncie, what do we do? We try to find every 2D face that's in that area. We try to find the nearest cross section if you cross a river, and we are going to add that information uh, up. This is not at the compute interval. This is what's available to us at the mapping interval. So when we're trying to sum up a flow time series here to get a hydrograph through a section of that model, it will frequently disagree by a little bit with a structure that's in a similar area. Because when you're aggregating data at the compute interval, you have a, a capacity for to get a more accurate answer there. So when you're asking these sorts of questions of the profile lines, just be aware that we are adding up kind of your nearest geometry information that we can find. We're adding it up at the mapping interval. It will be close, but it won't match exactly what the compute engine produces if you have an equivalent uh, internal uh, boundary condition or structure or something else that measures flow, that will always be a little bit more accurate. Um, the active features tab we went over before, in this case, it's cross sections. Anything that you can ask by right clicking on the map, you can also right click in the layer list here. The uh, one thing I'd like to emphasize here is that the context menus that you see in RASMapper many times are interpolated. You right click between two cross sections and say, hey, what's the water surface time series? And we're saying, well, you're upstream cross sections reporting this, your downstream cross sections reporting this, and we're going to merge the two to try to create a good or the best answer we can that's interpolating those two values. Whenever you see the keyword results here in front of the context menu, that is us trying to tell you this is coming actually out of the compute engine. So while RASMapper has to take some liberties interpolating to create a map from discrete compute points, when you right click a geometry element and see that results profile plot, 
hopefully that clues you into, oh no, this is the actual answer coming out of the compute engine. It's more of a uh, less interpolated, pure representation. Watch layer values. So this is what I was referring to earlier, where you can have multiple returns on your cursor. Uh, I believe at this point, you don't even have to have the maps on. You don't have to have all four maps um, on. Once you add them to the watch list, you can toggle some of them off so it's a little bit faster to pan around and move through the system, but it will uh, return the four, or in this case, four values under your cursor at all points in time. Web imagery. So there's two ways to get to this. One is by right-clicking on the map layers group, and one is by accessing through the RASMapper tools box. I'll show that in the demo later, but we have a collection of default web imagery uh, sources that we have aggregated. You can add your own. This takes a little bit of technical savvy, but if you have a core resource, a internal network resource that you can connect to ArcMap to show background imagery, uh, odds are you can connect it to RASMapper as well. So uh, we have some documentation on that. It's probably best to email us if you, are, if you have that kind of data and you're really curious about it. This is an example of the Google Maps for the same area. Plot options. So when all of the layers in the tree list on the left-hand side, you can right-click and there's a layer properties for each of them. Uh, it will bring up this window that you're seeing and uh, they're very uh, similar on the left-hand side there where if you have vector information, you can change the vector symbology. You can make your cross sections blue with a seven pixel wide border. Uh, for raster data, so in this case, it's a specifically terrain that we're looking at, you can change the raster symbology. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the additional options, that is gonna be your checklist for mo more specific to the layer that you're actually looking at. So if you have any result maps, we are going to uh, allow you to turn on things that are specific to uh, that particular result or that particular map. So in the bullet point on the upper right-hand side where you see the depth and water surface elevation here, uh, there are a handful of features that we find like aren't necessarily good on by default, but some people uh, need to see this information. Hydraulic connectivity is a particularly important one that we'll uh, look at a little bit later in the presentation. But if you ever find yourself wondering, hey, does RASMapper uh, draw a arrow to indicate which direction my river, my cross sections, and my profile lines are going. Yes, we do. If you go to the layer properties, one of the checkboxes will say draw directional arrows or label stationing with tick marks. So uh, fun to explore. Just uh, play around with these and see which ones that you like and kind of your default map state. Results mapping. So this is the core of how you're going to be viewing RAS results here. Uh, there are two different types of maps. So Dynamic and stored are uh, most of the time when people think, hey, it's a map, it's it's on disk, we produced it, we can hand it to somebody. That is what we call stored maps. Those wind up going to GeoTIFF files uh, within your RAS project folder. And uh, that is the product you can pass along to ArcMap that you can hand to somebody. Uh, that is a closer to a finalized product there. We highly encourage you to use dynamic maps for most of the work that you're going to be doing here. So as you're iterating through a model, as you're examining to see if your levy leaked, as you're working through all of this, the dynamic mapping is the uh, core uh, of what you're going to be working with. Uh, that allows you to use the slider bar. With dynamic mapping, we're looking at your screen resolution saying, oh, here's let's grab the best available terrain, but not too accurate if you're really zoomed out far in your model. And let's uh, come up with our best guess of what the depth, water surfaces, velocities are for your screen resolution. And because it's only doing it for your screen, it's fast enough to be doing on the fly and to not continuously have to store a really high resolution version of disk and then recall it every time you pan. This is how you create a new map. Uh, it's sectioned off into three discrete areas. The left third of it is where you will be selecting the map type. So uh, that's a single selection, pick one from the tree. The middle portion is going to be where you uh, select different map parameters. So in this case, in an inundation boundary map, you would select the profile that you want. In the case of an arrival time map, you might say, hey, I don't actually care about arrival time from the start of the simulation. I want to offset it by eight hours because that's when a dam breach occurred. 
that's this is where uh, each map will get a different middle column depending on what parameters it has and the right third is for the output type so we have two core groups here so underlined the generated for current view in memory that's what we call dynamic maps so those top two in particular the top one raster that's where a lot of your maps are going to live is say hey i want to be able to change time step it's going to generate as i move around and it's not going to leave a lot of fluff on disk uh, the stored state to disk portion right beneath that is how you would produce a product to send to somebody and there are some maps that have to be stored to disk because they're too slow to actually work with and we'll look at that in a little bit Oh, inundation boundary is kind of a special citizen that produces a polygon, but you can actually produce a polygon from any of these map types here. If you see the radio button on the right hand side, we could go to velocity and say, hey, produce a one foot per second velocity polygon if you're trying to get some concept of uh, hazard. And I think at 17 minutes, I'm a little bit behind where I wanted to be here. So I might bounce through depth of velocity. Um, arrival time, this is, uh, I think this is showing us us being flooded in Davis here right now. So if the dam to the west of us at Lake Berryessa were to uh, simultaneously collapse, uh, this is roughly what the uh, flood event would look like. And one of the cool things about this is that it's using a discrete color ramp. So instead of interpolated, we find for arrival time, we frequently want to think about things in terms of discrete hour steps. So you can see the moving wave front with a one hour contour here. So you could start to count, I guess, the first hour gets out to winters. The second hour collapses a little bit further. And we could count three, four, five. Maybe Davis gets hit in six or seven hours. It's roughly what this model is saying. Several different hazard maps we have available to us with psychedelic colors, DV, DV squared, stream power, and shear stresses. The, uh, fourth one. Uh, inundation boundary produces a polygon shape file. It basically looks at your zero depths and we contour it to your terrain resolution and I'll put that as a standard shape file. Uh, this is going back to the dynamic versus stored maps. We highly encourage you to use dynamic maps for most of the time that you're working with the product because it's computed straight to your screen resolution and it's faster to work with and it allows you to animate. Once we store something to disk that if you want a second profile of that, we have to do the entire process over again and store another X number of gigabytes to disk to uh, produce that. Um, you will see it as you zoom in very, very close into your model, there are differences between dynamic and stored results. So some people have emailed us saying, hey, there's a problem and occasionally there are bugs with it. So don't be afraid of emailing us and saying that. But frequently what we find is the difference is that a stored result has to produce a single value per terrain pixel. So particularly when you have 30 meter background terrain data, uh, we have to produce a single depth or water surface at that complete terrain pixel. But when we are producing a dynamic map, we are interpolating between adjacent terrain cells. So we produce a nice smooth boundary here. And the, uh, sorry, I'm kidding. Pink there. Uh, and we produce a nice smooth boundary when you're doing a dynamic map, and it should be within a cell of your stored map. Uh, animation bar works on the layer that you've selected. The dynamic map has a, uh, in this case, it has a discrete color ramp. So this is white is going to be like zero to one foot, zero to two foot, something like that, and then uh, various stages of blue. Uh, Oh, what the highlighted section here is showing you, you highlight a map and it'll show you your profile. Uh, that's this red arrow here. So it'll show you what time step you're on. You can control that with the animation bar. And further, if you want to move multiple maps at the same time, it worked as a parent to child uh, tree relationship. So if you have a single map selected, your animation bar moves only that map. If you have the parent result selected, it will move all of the maps that you currently have selected on. So if you're trying to synchronize maps, that's really helpful. You can synchronize maps across results as well. So in this case, there is a depth map turned on for each of these results. If you highlight the ultimate parent results layer here and then move the animation bar, it will synchronize the maps for all of your results that, or maps that you have checked on. So calculate layer, this is new for Ticto here. Uh, the calculated layer is a uh, it's a raster calculator that allows you to uh, work with these map values and 
you can add any number of maps, any number of terrains, and any number of general rasters that you have available to you. So this is a really, really powerful way of doing mathematical operations on the uh, uh, on a given set of input maps. So a really common one we find is you're doing a water surface delta across uh, two different maps. So if you're saying, hey, I ran a result, I changed the end values a little bit, did it really change the answer? Well, we can load in both of the water surface results here on the upper left side, and we can do a simple delta, right? We can say, oh yeah, the water actually did move sufficiently faster through the system. It did subtract two foot from the maximum water surface or from a, at a particular time step. Uh, any Anytime you're looking to compare values from different maps, this is a helpful thing, and we'll I'll go over this in the demo a little bit as well. Uh, stored maps, this is just showing that you can compute them in bulk. Uh, when you're interacting in the tree view and you see the little save icon, that means the map is stored. There's a red asterisk in the uh, upper right corner that implies, hey, something's wrong with this. In this case, you hover and it says map files are out of date. So you can then just right click and say compute update stored map. Um, in this uh, map layer properties, this is showing symbology stuff that's probably going to be easier to review in the demo here. Uh, showing different symbologies here. So you have a interpolated symbology. So it's a smooth color ramp from zero to 15 foot depth versus a uh, discrete symbology that uh, bulks it into uh, zero to two feet, two to six feet, et cetera. Contours, you can turn contours on pretty much any map that produces map values. So terrains, uh, water surface elevation depth, if you are interested in seeing uh, change in particular water surfaces because you could have uh, models that have a thousand foot water surface delta from the mountains down to the valleys there and if you're zoomed into a single portion it can be really hard to tell which way the water is actually sloping contours uh, help give you a sense of how how much it's sloping um sloping versus horizontal map types this this is important to think about, but mostly, uh, sorry, how do I say this? Um, most of the time you won't have to think about it because the sloping map type is a good representation of where the water is moving. Sometimes water will leak to an area you don't know about, or our sloping interpolation method will produce too much water. So RASMapper has to take cell values that the compute engine produces, and we have to uh, try to find that uh, darker blue dash line and say, okay, it, there's a smooth color or a smooth water ramp from A to B. Most of the time we do a pretty good job at distributing water and say it doesn't create or lose too much volume, but we know that water doesn't move in stair-step fashion. Therefore, we're gonna make our best guess at how water slopes through the system. Sometimes it won't go super, super well. This is an example where uh, you can see towards the lower right corner here, in uh, the right-hand side is our sloping approximation. And it actually erases water from a couple of these cells that uh, does exist in the model. So the compute engine said, hey, there's water here, but the water was sufficiently shallow and the terrain was sufficiently steep that uh, our sloping method effectively erased the water there. Uh, this is what that looked like in profile. As you can see, the left-hand side is a lot uglier and the stair step is uh, not how water actually moves, but when you think about how large the 2D cells are here, uh, the left-hand side is closer to what the compute engine is actually producing. The right-hand side is our smooth version saying, this is probably more accurately what it looked like. Uh, errors it can produce. If you have, this is like a rain on grid model with a really steep 15, 20 foot uh, canal here and an entire 2D cell spanning that canal, we can produce too much water. Uh, in there because it's trying to interpolate from the top of one side of the canal to the top of the other side. So if you ever think, hey, that doesn't quite look right, you can bounce over to the pure horizontal rendering mode and see, oh, no, it's just a really a couple inches. Now, all of that being said, we have by default a hybrid method when we render. So we try to start with the sloping method and say, you know what, we did some basic volumetric calculations and we produced too much water. I'm going to drag it down a bit, or I'm gonna to try to correct it a bit. So this used to be a bigger deal. For the most part, it's not now. You may still see some areas where you get an egregious amount of water visually because of the interpolation scheme. Might be reasonable to fall back to the horizontal rendering mode just to see uh, if that's true. Um, hydraulic connectivity. 
uh, is useful for showing how water got to a particular area. So you can see a very coarse mesh here for Muncie and water is percolating through the system. In this slide, it doesn't even appear that water has gotten to the cell yet, but there is a low elevation point close to the river channel here. I can tell you where it did leak through. Visually, it's not there. So uh, um, it is helpful to turn this on to see, oh, water actually is pushing through the system just at a very shallow level faster than I imagine. This is also really helpful for saying it got over a levee. How did water get to the levee? So if you miss your brake line by a little bit, if it's six inches below on, uh, you just miss the top of the levee, uh, this will say, hey, this cell to this cell, this is where water pierced the levee. Um, you can query a time series for any map type we have. You can right click on the map itself, ask for a time series. Uh, in this case, what we're showing are results plots. So these are values produced straight from the compute engine. I'll explain that in the demo. Uh, if you're really curious about the inner workings of the engine, you can query 2D hydraulic uh, properties there. How we think about the cells is a, uh, a bathtub that's uh, kind of a cone that's filling up from the bottom, how faces uh, have their minimum elevation allows water to pass from cell to cell. Yeah. So here's an example where we have a, uh, this is the, I believe the Bald Eagle Creek data set, and somebody has built a mesh where all the water is still in channel, but you can see there's a peak of high velocity here that uh, should imply to you as you're looking at this, hey, how did water get across this landmass? And maybe it's not really a landmass, maybe it's a bridge that was not removed from the terrain correctly. But if we do think of this as a, um, as a piece of land jutting out into the channel, no, water really shouldn't be piercing there. So velocity arrows uh, can help you uh, kind of clue into these sorts of uh, model errors. Um, we can turn on both static and dynamic uh, moving particles here. And uh, if you were I, uh, if you were to turn the mesh on, what you would likely see is there wasn't a brake line going through that bridge of high land. So a cell that covers that complete area here uh, likely didn't have a face uh, right over the top of the high ground leaked water. Uh, profile lines, we have, uh, as you draw your profile lines, save them in the bucket in the upper left features tab there. You can query them for pretty much any map type we produce, depth, water service velocity. Uh, that allows you to uh, use the animation bar as well. So when you're animating through them, uh, you use the map uh, animation control slider bar and you can see the water service move up and down on the profile line. I am a little bit behind schedule, so I'm going to bounce through a few of these slides. Uh, arrival time, in this case, along a profile line. Uh, these were two comparisons of uh, a profile line going down your stream center line for a dam breach. And for one of them, we artificially lowered the Manning Zen value a lot. You can see, hey, the uh, arrival time was a lot faster as water was able to percolate through the system there. Um, the one section, interesting section that you can see right here is a spike in the lower Manning's end value. So uh, you might zoom into this area and see, hey, what's going on there? Well, we can say likely what happened is uh, the Manning's end value was sufficiently low. Water didn't get deep at that portion along the profile line, and uh, it actually never got wet. So in, as we're sampling along the line to pick up values, if you're measuring arrival time here, you see a spike, uh, you could probably say, oh, water didn't even reach this area, so the arrival time is effectively infinite. Uh, all of these respond to the animation slider bar and play controls. And I think most of the rest of the presentation here is gonna be some pretty animations. Uh, this is us flooding in Davis right now from the Berryessa Dam breach. Um, oh, one of the specific profile line maps is a velocity against terrain here. So you can see a velocity heat map uh, across a channel if that's where your what your profile line is capturing. Uh, 